Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar series, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. We'll just give people a few minutes to stream in, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Let's uh, begin the webinar in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today from across the world. I would like to welcome you to the webinar series, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. Today, we are fortunate to have William Travis from the University of Colorado. He'll be talking to us about impacts and adaptation at the climate risk frontier. And, um, We, um, onto the next slide, please, Jen. So let me begin by uh, introducing the editors of the book. So this webinar series is based off a book that was recently published, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. This book is in honor of Martin Parry, who was a pioneer on climate impacts and played a key role in the 2007 IPCC reports. Martin is a visiting professor at the Center for Environmental Policy, Imperial College, London. He was co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2, Impacts, Adaptation and Vulnerability, and a convening lead author of three IPCC assessments. He has been a professor of geography at the University of Oxford, University College London, East Anglia, and Birmingham in the UK. We also have Cynthia Rosenzweig, um, she's a senior research scientist at Columbia University Center for Climate Systems Research and at the Na NASA Goddard Institute for Space, Space Studies, where she heads the Climate Impacts Group. She co-founded the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Ag uh, Improvement Project, uh, which is well known as AGMEP. She was a coordinating lead author for several IPCC assessments, and Cynthia was named one of nature's 10 people who mattered in 2012 and she has also been a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship. And then you also have me. I would also like to take a moment uh, to um, David Rind, who's here, is the series editor. So this is the second volume in the series. Uh, David, if you'd like, just you know, take a minute and uh, please introduce the book series to the audience. Hi, uh, yes, as uh, Manishka said, uh, this is the second in a series of books. The first was on, it, it, they, they in a way uh, sort of parallel uh, the IPCC working groups. The first were, was on sort of the dynamics of climate warming or lines up with the science of climate warming in the sense of looking at different aspects of the climate system, how one models them, what is happening to them, things of that nature. This then sort of parallels working group two on the impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. There is a, uh, a third book that should be out this year, which is on clouds and radiation associated with climate and climate change. Uh, all of these books have the unique aspect that they, uh, in addition to being having text associated with each of the major topics. They also include uh, PowerPoint slides that are available uh, 
online. Uh, one can download them. These are made so that people who want to use the information in these particular chapters will be able to use them either uh, for presentations that they are doing for colleagues or in classrooms. The thought was that a lot of uh, information coming out about climate and climate change is relatively new and many people in different parts of the world may not have the capability to be, to be teaching this subject with, the, with uh, relatively up-to-date information and these slides would be of use to them. Uh, uh, Manishka has put on uh, the topics associated uh, with the second book. And as you can see, outside of the introduction to climate change, the first uh, topic, all of them asso are associated with the different aspects of climate change impacts or adaptation. Back to you, Manishka. Thanks so much, David. Great to have you on. Jen, we can move on to the next slide, please. So we'll start off by um, getting to know the audience. You got to hear about the editors uh, and very soon you'll hear a little bit more about uh, William Travis. But before that, we'd like to get to know the audience. So we'll have a few polls. Then we have uh, Bill Travis speaking. Then Jen will do um, a brief Q&A. So uh, close to, you know, during the session or right after, please start typing your questions to the Q&A box and then we'll wrap up. So today's webinar, see, um, will be one hour. And to the next slide, please. And to the next. And I will begin the poll. So the first question, as you see, when as I launch this, is to really understand where our audience is from, because we are really aiming to, you know, have this available to, um, an audience from a really a global audience and also maybe in regions where perhaps resources are not so commonly available. So we really hope that uh, this will be useful to people from across the world. And it's really fantastic. Uh, we've got um, more than 70% of you participating in, in this and we have uh, as you'll see in a moment, participants really from um, across the world, which is really fantastic. It's very late in Oceania, so you know we really can't expect people joining from there. It's probably midnight, but really great to see people from, from all over. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and I'm going to move on to the next. We would love to hear more about um, you know, what sector everyone in the audience works on works in and focuses on. So uh, usually we have a, a range um, and almost every sector represented, which, uh, which has been amazing. So I see that today as well, uh, just such an incredible um, range of sectors being represented by our audience. I'll give it a few more seconds and then I'll share the results with everyone. Uh, fantastic, we have so many of you in the audience participating as well, 80%. Okay, and I'm gonna share the screen and you'll see that we just have every sector represented. Really, really nice to see that. And then we have our final um, question. Uh, this is to understand a little bit more about your involvement in climate change work. So, uh, you know, we, even with this question, there are so many, you know, people joining. Um, some of them are very involved. Some of them want to understand the topic more so that they can uh, spread the word, uh, be uh, educators. So um, it's, it's really great to have such a range of people joining us. So I'll give this a few more seconds and then, uh, then we can um, move on to the lecture. Okay, so I'm going to end uh, the poll and, and share the results. So once again, uh, you know, some people work directly, some people indirectly. So it's really great to see uh, 
such a diverse audience with us today. So I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, we'll move on to the next slide. If anyone has um, a question or a clarification, please use the uh, Q&A box or the chat function. Um, and also, um, just before we start with the presentation, I would like to encourage the audience, uh, you know, we, we understood um, sort of your interests and the sectors you represent based on the poll, but we'd also like to get to know you on a more individual um, basis. So you can share as much or as little information as you'd like, but feel free to include your name, uh, country, uh, institution, role, email, how you think this book might help you. Um, and you, know, you can use a chat function for that. And let me also copy and paste that so that um, you can um, start sharing that information. Yes. Okay, great. So let's get started. Um, one second, I'm just navigating my screen here. I have uh, multiple windows over here. So today's lecture will be delivered by William Travis from the University of Colorado. And the topic will be on impacts and adaptation at the climate risk frontier. But before we get on to that, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, William Travis. He's an associate professor of geography at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He studies the human dimensions of natural hazards and climate change with current projects focusing on risk and decision analysis applied to climate adaptation in agricultural, ecological, and infrastructure systems. Like Martin Parry, in whose honor this book was compiled, he started to study climate and society interactions in the 1970s. And his first study of adaptation to global warming was published in Climatic Change in 1981. Much of his early work on adaptation was based on interviews of farmers, water planners, and hazard managers. Now most of his work applies quantitative risk and decision analysis to simulate adaptation, evaluate the effects of extreme events in adaptation pathways, and develop tools that can help resource managers adjust to a changing climate. Bill, it's fantastic to have you and over to you to begin the lecture. Thank you. Great, it's good to be here with you. Let me make sure that the sound is okay, Manishka. It is, Bill, and we see you as well. And then now let me make sure that that I'm properly sharing the slides. Yes, you are. Okay, great. Well, Thanks. let's get let's get going then. Uh, I want to take a I want to start uh, by uh, talking a little bit about Martin Perry and his early work. Uh, this volume uh, is in honor of Martin, and uh, I uh, I'm using uh, the his first book, 1978. He studied uh, the impacts of actually uh, the Little Ice Age on agricultural settlement in Upland, Scotland. And he phrased this as the agricultural risk frontier, where relatively modest changes in climate could yield pretty large changes in society, in this case, land use, agricultural land use, with an idea that we can still use today, that sometimes we need to find places, times, uh, sectors, where the signal of response impact adaptation is large compared to, uh, to the disturbance from climate change. He, he um, elaborated on this work uh, at a conference on climate and history at the uh, University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit in uh, July of 1979. I was there as a graduate student and I remember this, this handsome British geographer going up to the lectern uh, and uh, discussing uh, how we could best ask questions about so social impacts of climate variation, not necessarily at the time global warming, how we could best ask and answer those questions. And he uh, put together uh, in his book and in that talk in 1979, uh, a framework, a hypothesis testing framework. One, we could look at risk frontiers where the climate signal would be relatively large. Uh, 
and the human, uh, the human pattern, in this case, the farms in upland Scotland, would be very sensitive to modest changes in climate. And we could hypothesize what we would see if the climate varied and then go and look in the historical data. In this case, we're talking historical analogs to say future climate change uh, and try to measure those impacts, a very scientific approach. And he elaborated on this at the talk at the 1979 Climate and History Conference uh, as a hypothesis testing model that is still would it's, it still should inform our work today in the sense that it's easy to um, perhaps speculate about what say the future climate will mean for uh, uh, agriculture infrastructure systems uh, but more important I think to follow this idea of let's uh, develop uh, testable hypotheses at least that can be tested through say simulation analysis which is what I'll uh, talk about a bit uh, here today. But through this, uh, through this work, uh, Martin was phrasing this idea that uh, the climate society interface could be, uh, could be looked at framed as a risk issue, a risk and decision making issue. And I think one, it's just interesting to find that now we see more today frequent calls for a risk approach in our work on uh, climate impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. And what does that mean, a risk approach? Is it, uh, sometimes the term risk is used just to say, oh, we have a risk of climate change, we have a threat. Uh, sometimes it's used specifically to refer to the need to examine the risk benefit, or let's say the cost benefit of mitigation. What might happen in an unmitigated global warming uh, scenario versus a mitigated global warming scenario, and then even compare the cost of mitigation to those uh, avoided losses to the climate that you uh, change that you can mitigate. But a risk framework is actually a broader and more uh, fundamental approach. We could use risk analysis, a template for quantifying the likelihood of events in the future, for instance. Uh, their impacts, uh, and then comparing adaptation or response options. And we link that with decision analysis, which is an axiomatic, but I think flexible approach to testing alternative uh, outcomes of choices, conditions and choices, uh, and aim for the best outcome. Now, decision analysis is often uh, uh, thought of as yielding a um, prescriptive, optimal outcome of choices and uh, environmental uh, conditions, but it can actually be used in a much more nuanced way to assess how we might adjust what might be satisfactory or, or satisfying uh, approaches to uh, climate risk. So I'll just remind you that the foundations of risk analysis is that risk is defined as the probability of an event times its consequence. And that reminds us that then high probability, low consequence events can pose the same risk as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, low probability, high consequence events. And we're interested not necessarily in their um, most likely outcomes, but often looking at the tails of distributions. And we can also uh, link risk analysis to decision analysis with the notion of expected value the likelihood of the outcome of a particular decision under a future range of climate conditions. Now, I admit that the uh, governing axiom of this work is that the decision maker should seek to get the maximum expected value out of their choices under uncertainty, climate uncertainty in this case. But again, I think we can show that uh, there's, um, uh, there's ways of analyzing, uh, of, of applying risk and decision analysis that give us more nuanced notions of how we might adjust, how our systems might respond, and how we might guide them uh, through a changing climate. Now, this idea that Martin phrased, the risk frontier is actually pretty common over in the finance world, uh, where the risk frontier is thought of as how much risk an investor is willing to take for a given amount of uh, payoff. Uh, and this risk frontier is applied, say, to a portfolio of stocks and bonds, uh, and, which have variable uh, yields, uh, and putting together portfolios that then yield an acceptable level of uh, return for a risky investment. Now, 
that now can we bring that into uh, adaptation to climate well I'm, I'm just I'm gonna go try also it, it is showing up so we we read more now about the idea of a risk frontier or a uh, acceptable or even maybe unacceptable outcomes of climate change you you certainly are would be aware of the move within the IPCC to uh, chart out reasons for concern in the burning embers uh, uh, graph of the last three assessment reports and in the most recent assessment on uh, working group two, the notion of hard and soft limits to adaptation and a lot of these ideas can be framed in this risk frontier and really in a way uh, going all the way back to uh, Martin's thinking of those farmers uh, who were on the edge of uh, uh, of of the agricultural productivity uh, going into the little ice age also going back to martin's hypothesis testing approach that he that he talked about at that meeting back in 1979 i remember it well it it affected my career i've been doing it ever since i've been applying his ideas since the for 40 some years uh, we can phrase risk and decision making as a hypothesis where we have some theory of how say agriculture farmers or, or infrastructure managers or uh, uh, natural area managers might uh, 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 assess the risk of climate change make decisions apply those decisions and then assess how good their decisions are turning out and then reapply uh, as more information comes in and we can then start to think about the value of additional information like better climate projections uh, when Martin started working, when I started working in this, we, we didn't have much in the way of climate model projections. Uh, that's one reason so many historical analogs were used at the time. Uh, now, all, all of you working in this area have actual climate change, including uh, signals of global warming, to point out to, uh, to your clients, uh, to those you're trying to convince that we're, we're dealing with a with a changing climate. Uh, back in the 1970s, it was a little bit more difficult. Soon, though, we, we were able to acquire uh, climate modeling to link to our ideas of how society would respond. I remember <laughs> fondly uh, begging David Rind to send us output from the GIS model. Uh, it wasn't available online. The internet wasn't even, it didn't e even exist. Uh, and we needed the, those of us looking at impacts needed some access to the model output, which was in a very rarefied world. And thanks, David, for sending those slides to us all so that we could uh, see the world as the climate models were seeing the world in the next, then the next century. So let me bring this to uh, a case. I, I've been looking at this uh, frontier between a particular type of wheat, winter wheat, and spring wheat in here in the American Great Plains. And something's been happening. This is one of the fastest warming parts of North America, right here in the Northern United States, especially in the winter. And the warming is quite remarkable and people notice and they have noticed, especially if you live in North Dakota, a place where the winters are very cold, uh, you might even appreciate the warming. But one of the effects of this warming has been that farmers who have grown a particular type of wheat, spring wheat, uh, are thinking about use, uh, growing other crops. Uh, winter wheat is more popular and there's much more winter wheat produced around the world and in the United States. It's actually sown in the fall. It sits dormant in the field over the winter. And then in the spring, it's already in the field and it can use the spring moisture to uh, start to produce large leaves and uh, larger seeds. So its yield is pretty good. Uh, the spring wheat farmers up here in North Dakota, it's too cold in the winter to have that wheat sitting out there. It'll die in four out of 10 winters right now in the last few decades, uh, the winter wheat won't even make it through the winter. Uh, so they grow spring wheat and they plant it in the spring. They have to wait until the soil is tractable, is dry enough to get the seed in the ground. Uh, and then they've got their wheat growing right through the hottest part of summer. The winter wheat producers have, this, have the plant already in the ground in spring, and it can use that wet period uh, with larger soil, higher soil moisture to uh, boot up uh, and start to produce the, the, the seed head. So uh, economists, ag economists and others have noticed that farmers up here in the north and into Canada as well, 
have been experimenting with winter wheat, noticing that their winters are getting milder. You can actually see this is the winter minimum temperatures. It's one of the uh, most dramatic temperature uh, warming uh, 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 signals in the uh, lower 48, the, uh, the contiguous uh, United States. Now imagine that the problem here, the risk problem is that, let me just get my controls out of the way of myself here. The risk problem here is that not only uh, does this, um, uh, let's look at this graph in the lower right, not only uh, might you have lower yields in a year that doesn't produce the climate that the crop uh, is most adapted to, but you have a relatively large probability in winter wheat grown in a cold place of no yield at all. Uh, the the uh, crop does not make it through the winter. It it uh, it experiences winter kill, uh, and you get no income from it. The, the one thing you save is the har the harvest costs. And you could imagine this a scenario in which this uh, very skewed distribution of yield slowly evolves so that winter wheat in a warmer climate with warmer winters starts to look more like the distribution of spring wheat, which the farmers are growing now. And so some farmers are experimenting. Uh, we're not quite certain where uh, that, that frontier would be where it makes sense to switch completely from spring to winter wheat. Winter wheat has some, some, uh, some qualities, uh, some desirable qualities, including uh, a slightly higher yield and uh, in some years, a better market uh, value. So let's then simulate what a farmer would make if they stayed with uh, spring wheat or switched to winter wheat at different probabilities and in this case, lowering probabilities of losing the crop to winter kill. Uh, we can compare then, uh, we're using now both probability, but we're also looking at the outcome for the farmer, their net crop income. And we can then map or at least uh, build, a, build a model that would allow us to project when in a warming climate with those winters getting more uh, conducive to winter wheat surviving, when in a time frame in the future, uh, winter wheat would be comparable to spring wheat in its risk and its return. Now, spring wheat is changing too. The summers are getting a bit warmer, but it happens in this area uh, that that slight warming in the summer has been offset by some uh, increase in rainfall so that the net soil moistures and the growing conditions for spring wheat haven't changed as much as they have for winter wheat. And here we are, we have this, uh, a couple of ideas. Uh, we have to add one more policy framework. Risk reduction in agriculture may be associated with the crop that you grow, the way you uh, treat it and till it, uh, industrial uh, chemical inputs uh, like pesticides and fertilizer, but also Many national governments uh, and the private sector provide insurance to farmers. Uh, and if insurance is available, it allows the agriculturalists to, off, uh, to, to, to send some of that risk over to a, a larger pool of risk takers. Now, right now, the US Department of Agriculture does not offer insurance for winter wheat up in the north uh, because it has this 40% chance of not making it through, through the year. Uh, but in the future, uh, if the winter kill rates were, say, to come down to 30, 20, or even 10 percent, more like the drought uh, 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 impact rates for spring wheat, might a agricultural insurance program evolve. So not only will we look at when winter wheat might be comparable to spring wheat, uh, without insurance, that looks to be around... Um, uh, 2030 or so in this uh, scenario, which starts includes some historical years. Uh, but if we could provide insurance, say, at a 20% chance of winter kill, uh, we might move up that switch, that frontier where it works to uh, switch to winter wheat, uh, uh, maybe even uh, almost, almost a decade. We, we could imagine uh, farmers adapting a bit sooner. And then we can also map, at least in the probabilities,
where uh, the frontier is between uh, winter wheat and spring wheat and ask the question, at what rate of insurance, what yield factor, winter wheat provides a higher yield than spring wheat, uh, this transition might occur. Now, this is a pretty incremental adaptation. The farmers don't need to uh, get uh, new equipment. All they need to do is uh, buy a different seed and learn, by the way, how to grow winter wheat, which takes some differences. You put it in the ground in the fall, uh, you wait until the spring to dress it with fertilizer. Uh, so there are some changes involved, but it's a relatively modest change. It's not like switching between agriculture and, and say, uh, pastoralism, the bigger transformative changes. So let me just switch and talk a few minutes about other types of adaptations and how we might analyze them as uh, through risk and decision analysis. Another frame that's showed up uh, in this topic has been adaptation pathways. The idea that uh, you are face a changing future. You have a system. Adaptation pathways have come out, especially from uh, the group in the Netherlands, ha uh, Hasnut, uh, uh, Walker, um, uh, Quackle, and others, to uh, think about flood management or uh, storm surge management on the uh, on, on the North Sea, uh, and they. Uh, have put together this, this, this figure that you probably have seen before in various ways in which the idea is that over time, you, you have to make some incremental decisions, but you might think about how each of those adaptation decisions then will behave 10, 20 years down the line, say in this case when sea level is higher or um, the, the frequency of storm surges has changed. Uh, and you can ask yourself, well, what can I do today? I'm not really ready to make the big decision yet uh, to change all of my, my sea defenses, uh, but what am I doing today in maintenance or smaller incremental adaptations uh, that I could do somewhat differently given the potential that I might wanna switch adaptation, transform my approach uh, in the future? And they use this idea of a, of a graph in which you changed your pathway. So let's think about it. Here's a, we did a quick analysis. We've been watching, a, this is not sea defenses, but say road culverts. Now a culvert is the, uh, the, the pipe or the concrete uh, structure that lets uh, uh, a stream uh, cross a uh, roadbed without being dammed up and uh, piling up behind the dam, uh, behind the road and damaging it. And they're, in, they're, they're used around the world to convey water from one side to the other of a roadbed. And the pathways that we imagine here is uh, how do you, in a world here in the mid latitudes in which uh, precipitation uh, intensity is indeed increasing, uh, we see right here in the county I live in an increase in uh, heavy rain events that are damaging uh, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. And these uh, installations are really sensitive to how much rain falls in a short period of time, like just a half an hour or an hour, and they have to be replaced when they're damaged. But if you have the sense that the future is uh, going to provide more intense rainfall events, which is pretty well accepted by uh, transportation engineers across at least the mid latitudes here in North America, uh, might you start to put yourself on a particular adaptation pathway? And we test a few of them. And uh, uh, one of them, uh, is sort of the obvious nominal one, is that, hey, when it's time to replace a culvert, you replace it uh, at the end of its useful life. You could also imagine, though, that you might want to increase the size of your culvert every time you replace it. And you might replace it when uh, it's reached the end of its useful life, or perhaps it's been damaged by a recent heavy event. So this allows us to start to think about risk decision-making and adaptation that is, uh, that is timed by the experience of extremes. And we can imagine this in coastal retreat from sea level rise and other, in other cases. Another approach, of course, is that you have some pro projection of the future. And whenever you are in the business of upgrading your system, you anticipate the future climate, in this case, rainfall intensity and runoffs uh, 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 discharge uh, uh, volume and uh, you uh, anticipate by enlarging the system uh, now or in, in the future, or you enlarge it, say, when uh, uh, you've had enough damage that you're convinced that you need to be 
uh, uh, changing the system. So we're talking about the timing uh, uh, of adaptation. Uh, so we put together a model and we throw in uh, events. Uh, we, we have uh, flood damage to, uh, uh, to the, the roadbed because the, the culverts are undersized. We do uh, 100 years of simulation for dozens and dozens of culverts here in Colorado. And we ask this question, when should you start adapting? Should you wait for more impacts and then start to enlarge the size? Since you know if you're convinced that the future climate will bring you more intense rainfall, do you uh, take some time, go to the city council or the county commission and ask for a larger budget and start to enlarge the size of your stream crossings and your road network or your railroad network? It's expensive. Uh, and I'll just say, by the way, let's look at quick results. It depends, of course, on the rate of the change. Uh, and uh, it works out that if you adapt too soon in a system like this, uh, you'll actually uh, be wasting money. You, you're, 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 experience, you're, you're taking part in a premature adaptation. Yes, you're, you're getting your system ready for um, uh, a future in, a change in intensity of rainfall, uh, but you're wasting some of the installed capacity that you're replacing in anticipation. Concurrent approaches, especially if you replace uh, and enlarge the culverts when you get some damage, not complete destruction, but just uh, uh, damage to say 50% of the value of the culvert, uh, that actually works uh, out efficiently from a risk point of view. Now, I want to mention there are limits to this approach to uh, analyzing, simulating, and even then prescribing adaptation choices. And one of them here, for instance, if you accept that you're going to use culvert damage as a pacemaker to adaptation, then you're, you're uh, experiencing, you're allowing a decrement in public safety. Because when a culvert washes out, the road is no longer safe to use. Uh, and this happened in my county in 2013 in a large heavy rain event. Uh, and uh, some culverts washed out during the night, and uh, a couple of cars went into the went into the stream. No lives were lost, uh, but and those culverts have been replaced and they've been enlarged. But that may not be. Uh, you have other considerations uh, other than this: the economics uh, and the engineering of culverts. I just want to end by mentioning something. Uh, I was inspired by Pam Barry Barry's talk in this. Uh, uh, in this series, uh, we're seeing the emergence of a strategy among ecosystem managers, uh, forest managers, national park uh, planners, and uh, species, uh, fish and wildlife uh, uh, managers to think about how they would, what strategy, what's their, what's their position for the, for the future in a, in a changing climate that would affect their ecosystem. And I'll end with this. And a, a, um, a theme has shown up, uh, that they have, a, they have a few strategic uh, spaces they could be in. Right now, they're kind of in the resist space. Uh, there's an increase in forest dieback due to beetles, uh, a pest that kills the trees. Uh, and uh, they're going to reseed after a fire or after a beetle kill with the same species. So they're trying to keep the system the way it is. This is a pretty standard uh, approach to sustain yield uh, ecosystems management. Uh, another approach is that they accept and tell their clients, uh, their stakeholders, that, you know, things are changing. We're just going to have to accept that uh, our cold water fisheries are now further up in altitude. And part of the fishing that you've experienced in, uh, in this part of the stream is no longer available because the water has warmed up due to uh, warmer nights, for instance. Or we want to take a more active role and help move the system along to, uh, to a future that is better adapted to the changing climate. So this has uh, been phrased the RAD uh, decision or strategy structure, resist, accept, or direct. Now, uh, this is really important, especially to the stakeholders who may not appreciate uh, land managers here in the Western US where we have a say the, the National Park Service, may not appreciate them actually taking active part in moving ecological systems toward some future state. Like for instance, as, as Pam uh, mentioned, uh, moving species to 
uh, say, uh, where we think they can take refuge in the future climate. Uh, and so this idea of adaptation strategy over time, given a set of risk and risk payoffs, is uh, I think a, a valuable one, one way, not, not the only way, of analyzing uh, the challenge of making, uh, assessing risk and making decisions, adaptation decisions, that I think will yield fewer surprises in a changing climate. Thank you so much, Bill. That was a wonderful lecture. And um, I've, I've just got to figure out how to stop sharing my slides, right? <laughs> yes, but don't worry. Take take a minute to do oh, that. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, yeah. Yes, have, yes that's, I think I think we're right on time, aren't we? You're perfect, Bill. Um, we would have given you a few extra minutes too because we didn't want to cut you short. Um, that was fantastic. I think you've been working on this for quite some time, but I think um, for a lot of people, uh, this really seems to be an emerging topic. Um, we want to move on to the Q&A session. So uh, over to Jen uh, to begin the live Q&A session. Sure, so I see there are some questions coming in. Uh, so we invite you all to use the, the Q&A uh, function. Uh, but I'll start uh, with the first question. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could expand on your journey with climate research and what it was like working on climate change uh, in the 1970s and kind of how that has evolved since. Well, I just, yes, imagine back then, I mentioned how uh, we didn't have uh, the model output to work with. Those of us who wanted to do impact, right? There was also, and it may still be true a bit today, some tension between commitment to studying and helping adaptation and the commitment to mitigation. Uh, it's, it, was, uh, it was palpable early on. Uh, before, I'm talking the 1970s and 80s, let's say at the very first pre-IPCC meeting in Toronto in, I think, 1980 or so, uh, the idea uh, was that, uh, yes, we we're going to already need to be thinking about decarbonizing the economy, but um, uh, and, and we, we need to prevent this potential significant change in our environment, which, we're, which we are causing. Uh, and those researchers like me, Martin and others who were looking at adaptation, well, okay, uh, I think our position now is, yes, we need to, we definitely need to mitigate that which we can mitigate, but let's also be ready as history has now shown us to ad adapt to uh, which we can't mitigate. Of course, the other point back at, in the 1970s and 80s is that we didn't have as much actual palpable change to, uh, uh, to point to. Uh, my farmers in North Dakota that I, this farmers in North Dakota that I study, they tell me that their warm, winters are getting warmer. I don't have to convince them it, it, anymore. Uh, and uh, so that, that makes life a little, a little easier in this field. Uh, and last but not least, uh, uh, there's a lot more interest, right? So <laughs> this is a, uh, uh, I've, I've never would have imagined uh, in, the, in the 70s and 80s that the issue of global warming would become what it has, uh, and it's an important. I, 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 it, it, uh, some say it's an existential problem. Uh, we we more thought about it as an interesting academic question. To put it thank that you, way. thanks, Jim. thank you so much. It's so interesting. Um, so let me see. We have some questions in here. Uh, so. An attendee says, thank you very much for the really interesting presentation. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on the sentence, I think it was on slide two or three, about how we have not defined climate risk simply by defining the problem of a certain climate state. How would you define climate risk generally? Yeah, and I want to say that I think it's really important to, to use the, con when you want to use the term risk, I'm just going to say it's important to use it in its technical in its technical definition, uh, say from the Society for Risk Analysis and all those who work. Most of that comes from, say, industrial processes, studies of risk of, say, nuclear power plants and all. But the framing of risk is the likelihood of the event that you're interested in 
and its consequence together. The event itself is not the risk. We might call that the hazard, uh, a, a change in climate or a change in the frequency or say the rainfall intensity of tropical cyclones, which we, we, we think we may be seeing. That's the state of nature from a risk assessment point of view and the consequences together then define the risk. So you could imagine that you may have a change in climate and if you can adapt to it, then you can actually manage the risk and you can lower, you can lower the risk. And that's um, the way I have to, as a risk assessor, I want to uh, phrase risk that way, define it that way, and then I can go try to measure it. It's not the only, it's, there's no problem with using the term loosely uh, but if you're going to conduct risk assessment, uh, uh, I think it needs to be defined in that way. So you have to put as much work into assessing the likelihood of the event as you do the consequences. Great. Okay. So next we have uh, Joel Smith asking, uh, please discuss how one should address low probability, high consequence outcomes in a risk management approach. Perhaps think of it in the context of culverts, assume a wide range of potential increases in extreme flow. What are the trade-offs between placing equal weight on various scenarios or placing more weight on extreme scenarios? Might the decision differ in the spring versus winter wheat context? So, yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's good to hear from my colleague and friend, Joel Smith, uh, who also has a chapter in this, in this volume. Uh, and my my sort of <laughs> my sort of weak uh, response is to say, hey, the definition of risk already uh, takes care of that because the higher consequences in the at least in the universe that we all live in, uh, the higher probability, excuse me, the higher consequence or the more intense events tend to be rare. Thank goodness, right, that the world works out that way. Uh, so the risk is um, decremented by the lower probability of the, probability. Uh, more lo of the more intense events. But I get the question, get the qu Joel, which is uh, how do we handle, and this is a large, enduring, abiding philosophical question in risk and risk management, the really rare events like say major tipping points in the climate, how do we think about them? Uh, how do we bring them into our analyses? And my example, which all we did was take the, the likelihood of reasonable one hour, two hour, and five hour rainfall intensities, put them into our model with the different culverts, and then we would damage the, the, the culvert. All right, fine, it's not a big deal. It's a bigger deal, say, if the thermal haline circulation of, North, of the North Atlantic shuts down over the next uh, half century or if parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet disintegrate, these tipping points are, um, these are the low probability, high risk. And I, I guess Joel I'm, and others, um, uh, all we can do is, uh, some of us need to devote more of our time to thinking about uh, really very, uh, even in a world in which I think we've managed to bend down the curve of the, of, of the concentration pathways. And we're going to be bending that curve down. We still have to keep some room in our analyses and remind people that very low probability, high consequence outcomes are still possible. And the great question that Joel just raised, I don't have a good answer for is, how much effort do we put in analyzing those possibilities and preparing for them? Great, okay, so next from uh, Abdullah Sar is wondering about uh, your involvement on projects in Africa and if you support proposals on climate change adaptation on agriculture in West Africa. And a great, uh, a great question. So let me just uh, say that my work has been mostly focused uh, here in the United States. Uh, I've been studying those farmers in North Dakota since I did my dissertation. Uh, my PhD dissertation. So uh, like any researcher, I have a, a limited uh, view uh, and um, I uh, have to find, I have to know my limitations. But I do think the great question uh, in the future is how, what, how, how will the climate support or not support uh, agricultural uh, uh, development, say in, say in Africa and elsewhere? Uh, and what 
are do we need to uh, envision and uh, perhaps analyze and provide the resources for more transformative adaptation? I think there's a key question. Um, it's again, I'll, I'll say I have very little uh, understanding of agricultural systems outside the few that I study here in the United States. But what does it mean for uh, smallholders or larger uh, industrial agriculturalists to change very dramatically uh, what they do, not just the, the, the variety that they're using, but say switch their whole production system from say a particular crop to, uh, to, to pastoralism, uh, uh, adding irrigation, a very expensive input, does it pay off in a future set of, of climate scenarios? We can do risk assessment, and that does put us back into the fairly common uh, approach to risk assessment in which, say, some entity is thinking about a very different future and wondering what they might do today. So I'm, I'm going to move back to pathways. What they might do today that enlarges the options of what they could do under a different uh, future set of conditions. But excuse me for not being very specific for a whole agricultural system uh, that I'm not familiar with. Transformative adaptation is another, it's like the, the, the high consequence tipping points uh, that in the previous question. Uh, how do we think about how well positioned we are to actually say, uh, retreat from the coast, the most heavily populated uh, parts of, uh, of the world, big cities uh, right at sea level. How, how do we think about a future in which we're actually, what, walling them off, abandoning them? How do we think about a future in which our agricultural systems are uh, dramatically changed because of the climate or and also other goals uh, of society? And um, excuse me for having uh, yeah, I get the question. I see the I see the comment in the chat uh, for having some maybe sort of limited brain power for thinking about a fully transformed future. By the way, which also needs to be linked to a uh, future uh, decarbonized future. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I think they're leading to some great expansions on the presentation. Oh, it looks like we have. Uh, one more, oh, maybe two more. Uh, we'll see if we have time for. So Ro S uh, says, how excellent talk and approach. How can those who care about this influence policymakers to take seriously the risk modeling and attribution of climate effects and channeling finances to mitigate huge societal costs rather than the current approach of reacting to weather disasters? Well, that, and that's what it's actually, that's the goal, isn't it? And the whole process of risk assessment is to uh, make choices. For instance, let's take where risk assessment in the United States was the type of quantitative work that I do was really born. It was when the uh, country was tr trying to decide how much to invest in nuclear power and how safe it would be. And the type of analyses, uh, decision matrices, uh, risk matrices, uh, uh, decision trees were developed uh, and quantified at that time for making a big policy decision. Now, by the way, I'm not convinced that that policy decision turned out especially uh, uh, well, but, and that's just my opinion, but the point of risk analysis and decision analysis is to make the best decision you can at the time with the information that you have, and then make strategic choices that allow you to uh, change when you have to in the future. And I think if we can get that message to policymakers, uh, they do this all the time, thinking about hazards and flood and flood insurance. Flood, I think the insurance world is uh, becoming a bigger player in climate adaptation. Uh, so I, I think we can, I think we can sell it. Uh, cautious, uh, well thought out uh, decision analysis that uh, doesn't mean that the policymaker or the politician has to take that choice but at least uh, we've shown them this range of potential uh, option, uh, uh, outcomes and uh, how, what we think would be a better range of choice and uh, would yield fewer bad surprises in the future. Thank you so much, Bill, for your thoughtful answers. That's all we have time for, unfortunately, for the questions today. Uh, and back to Manishka. <laughs>
Thank you, Jen and Bill. Uh, those are great questions from the audience. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get to all of them, especially because uh, Bill has um, a student who's defending uh, their PhD thesis today, so we don't want to keep him here too long. Um, but before I begin the wrap up, I want to give uh, David an opportunity to um, help us uh, wrap this up. And also, uh, if you have any comments and thoughts on today's lecture, David. Thanks, Bill. Again, very clear, very lucid, uh, very uh, accessible discussion of this topic of adaptation. Uh, back in the 80s, one of the things we realized about adaptation was that it is a changing target because climate will not warm to a new climate. It will warm to a new climate and then another new climate and another new climate. So the bottom line in any adaptation we thought at that point was increased flexibility. Uh, we were asked by the Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York, uh, an issue associated with the subways. The subways underneath uh, the, the MTA was going to build uh, by new subway cars, which they felt they would now make sure they were air conditioned so they would be safe during summer. But they heard Jim Hansen's talk uh, to Congress in the late 80s, and they realized that the stations themselves, while people were waiting for the subways, might become unbearably hot. So they asked us, they said, well, you know, in the next number of years, we're going to rebuild these stations. Uh, this is, is your uh, comment about if you're, if you're having to repair or rebuild something anyway. So they said, should we put in air conditioners? And this then also gets back to your comment about not necessarily spending money now, that's ahead of the game in effect. What we suggested was, if you're gonna rebuild the station anyway, leave room for air conditioners so that if you need subsequently to put them in, you'll have that capability to do it. Well, they did rebuild the stations. <laughs> I have no great confidence that they left room for air conditioners. But anyway, I think it sort of elucidates the points you were making so very clearly. Well, and also the question was raised about how you get policymakers uh, to yeah. uh, pay attention to the risk analysis. And let's say we're analysts and we should always be asking these questions and making these recommendations. Uh, and it is in the different world where decisions are made, right, Dave? Yes, yes. Great, let's uh, just wrap up. Uh, I just want to wrap up by thanking uh, Bill Travis for the wonderful talk he gave, uh, so relevant uh, to um, my work and I think to the work of a lot of people in the audience today. The objective of the book, um, so the recordings are available. I shared this in the chat as well from the NOAA CC RUN website. We will be updating that very soon so we'll get some of the more recent lectures as well. We will also email you about the next webinar that's happening in two weeks. We're just in the process of finalizing the speakers for that. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, it was great to have your very active participation. The object of the book and the webinar series is to reach a wide audience of students, teachers, professionals, all people who are interested in the topic of climate change. Uh, we hope that these resources will help advance climate change education across the world. And uh, once again, thank you all for your participation. Thank you uh, to Bill, David, Jen, and all of you. And we'll hope we hope to see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Bye then.